Welcome, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you so much for being here at the Roar webinar series. You are um, really the expert in employee wow. resource groups. Uh, you're the creator of the 4C model. Um, share what the 4C model is first. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to you know, chat with you. I know, uh, you know we've been friends for many years. It was good to uh, get a chance to, to reconnect. Uh, yeah, you know, the 4C model is, is something that I created oh, almost uh, about 10 years ago when I started doing some more consulting uh, with employee resource groups. And, and what happened was when, you know, I, in working with these different companies, I noticed that sev several of them had some sort of, you know, strategic framework or operating pillars, you know, some would call them workforce, workplace, marketplace, you know, at another company, they would call it, you know, something else, but not every company had a strategic framework. So what I realized is there was an opportunity to uh, create a, a framework for those companies that didn't have one. Uh, and, and quite honestly, you know, it just this concept of the 4C model just took off. So, so basically, you know, all the 4C model is, is a framework that says that anything these employee resource groups do can fall into one of four buckets, right? One is careers, right? And that's all your lunch and learns, your mentoring initiatives, your workshops, your, you know, bringing in, uh, you know, executives to serve on a panel, you know, anything designed to elevate and advance the career advancement uh, of the members, right? So that's the career bucket. Uh, community, pretty self-explanatory, right? That's your community outreach, your volunteering for nonprofits, you're establishing a sense of community, collaborating with other groups, uh, that falls into the uh, community bucket. Uh, commerce, right? That's, that's the one that was often missing. Uh, and commerce are all your business related initiatives, right? Anything that an employee resource group does to align its efforts back to the company's business goals and objectives. So helping uh, with multicultural marketing initiatives, for example, su supplier diversity, uh, those sorts of things. And then the fourth C is culture, right? And, and those are the activities aimed at elevating the cultural competency uh, within a company. So real simple, uh, career, community, culture, commerce, uh, 4C framework, uh, and at last count, I would say maybe close to 200, 250 companies now use the 4C model as the framework for their employee resource groups. In fact, uh, I was in Silicon Valley right before this whole kind of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, sitting in on an ERG conference, and there was one company, uh, PayPal, uh, was there. They were talking about their employee resource groups, and they said they used the 4C model, uh, which I thought was great, but you know, I've never spoken to anyone at uh, PayPal. And it's just, you know, they had picked up on it from another company, loved it, so it may be even more prevalent than I think. But yeah, it's been around for about 10 years. Uh, very proud of it. Um, Robert, I'm so sorry. For some reason, our system, um, used when I uh oh Ooh. give me one second okay these things happen all the time I know. I'm not sure if you can see or hear me. Um, I, I can. I can hear you just fine. Uh, I see your picture, but you're not. It's not a live feed, which, which is okay yeah. with me. Um, but uh, yeah, as long as you can hear me, uh, okay, without an echo, I can. You know, I can still keep going if you'd like. Yes. So I'm curious. Um, you know, as we think about employee resource groups, and we think about uh, the commerce, the community, the career. What was the fourth one? Culture. Co uh, yeah, the culture, yeah. yes. Yep, yep, so yep. we're thinking about this, and companies often think that employee resource groups are, I think you, you referenced this at one point, flags, fun, and food. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they, they're really still at that point where they're not leveraging the uh, resource groups. Can you talk about how they can pivot from where they're at to really position themselves to leverage the sure. employee resource groups. Absolutely. Now, now one thing just to clarify, you know, that this food flag and fun image that some employee resource groups have, 
you know, I don't want to marginalize that work, right? You know, the, the social activities, the, you know, the getting together, the cultural celebrations, that's absolutely a key, a key component of the value that employee resource groups provide. So I'm not uh, diminishing those efforts. But what has happened is that some companies, the ERGs, they, they only stay within that realm, right? They, they don't expand uh, their value proposition to the company. And, and then, so they get this perception, uh, particularly by middle managers, that says these groups are most social in nature. And so that's why the commerce part has really increased in importance, I would say, particularly over the last ooh, 36, 48 months, right? Where companies are actually changing the name of their groups to business resource groups. Uh, and, and what I've found is that in many cases, these employee resource groups have wanted for years to support the business, but it was more of a, uh, an instance where the company didn't know how to leverage them, right? So in, I often would tell companies that you have an underutilized business asset, right? Because the ERGs are jumping up and down saying, hey, use us, we're here to help. And the company was saying, you know what, we're good. You know, we know what we're doing. We have an outside company that helps us with those things. And they really weren't being utilized. So, so the progressive companies realized that, hey, there's some untapped uh, value in these employee resource groups. And that's where the commerce part has really started to, to elevate. You know, when an ERG can articulate the value that they have uh, on a business, it's, it's difficult for them to really get the credibility and respect that they deserve because folks will marginalize their efforts to kind of that food, flag, and fun category when they can give a lot more. That is, um, so leveraging, talk to me about how a company can leverage their resource groups. I've heard companies really kind of um, use uh, or leverage resource groups um, for new marketing products. Absolutely. Uh, um, I've also heard of companies that uh, use them for or leverage, let me uh, be clear on that, leverage them for recruiting and retention. Is that what you're, you're finding a lot of? Uh, yeah, yeah but, so, but even being leveraged in, many, so, uh, in so many other ways. For example, you know, I've, I've seen where uh, companies in the pharmaceutical industry right, will leverage their ERGs to help diversify their clinical trials, right? Well, they'll say, hey, we're testing this new drug. You know, we don't have too many people in our clinical trials that are African-American, Asian, American, Hispanic. Can you help us identify folks that might want to participate, right? So they're expanding the, the research base for a company. Uh, I know I've done some work with uh, Uber, Uber, for example. Uh, during this whole uh, start of this pandemic and folks started to utilize more, you know, Uber Eats, if you will, they have an immigrants ERG, so they leverage their immig immigrants ERGs to help identify, you know, ethnic restaurants that could benefit from having their uh, food be delivered, whereas before they didn't, right? So they were supporting the business that way. I've seen companies leverage their ERGs to help with supplier diversity, saying, hey, we would like to tap into more women and minority-owned businesses to provide some of these services that we, we need. Can you help us identify who some of those organizations can be? Uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, the, the business part, the commerce part doesn't always have to be helping a company sell more widgets necessarily, but it's, are they able to articulate in some manner that they're supporting a business issue that's happening? And a recent one that I saw, uh, just to give you one more example, is uh, I know of a company that they are trying to get their employees to buy more stock, right? They have an employee stock ownership plan. And what they're doing is they're leveraging their ERGs to help kind of drive that message saying, hey, we think uh, employee stock ownership is, is a great value. Uh, ERGs, can you help us get that message out? And they've helped to increase the penetration rate of, ER of employees who own stock. So there's a variety of ways uh, that companies can leverage their ERGs to support the organization on top of the ones that you mentioned. Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes um, it's mutually beneficial. Right, Absolutely. because at the end of the day, you're spending the most amount of time you spend is at work, right? Yeah. You're spending eight hours plus at your work, whether it's at home now or in a physical office. And it makes sense that you would feel like you're part of getting the company beyond where it's at. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Whether now, it's because you're helping them attract more talent, as you mentioned, beyond um, you know the the Uber Eats idea. I love that because yeah. I use Uber Eats or Grubhub yeah. Yeah. all the time, especially now, and mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily looking for always American food. Oftentimes I'm looking sure. for Puerto Rican food or Dominican food or something that I personally like. So yeah. I, and who I knows, yeah. And who knows who those restaurants are other than people in those communities, right? Or from those uh, demographic groups, right? So that's where, uh, you know, that really comes in. Now, uh, to further validate what you just said, you know, absolutely. I think the members benefit when they are uh, more linked in with the business, but we do have to be, you know, for those ERG leaders out there, you know, just to give them a heads up, there might be some pushback, right, from their members, right, because some of their members may say, hey, wait a minute, every day when I come into work, I'm helping the business, right, that's what I do, that's what I get a paycheck for, you know, I joined the ERG so I can give back to my community, you know, I joined the ERG so I could just meet more like-minded people, right, I joined this ERG so I can dispel myths and get rid of stereotypes. I didn't join the ERG to help my company sell more widgets. So, you know, and, and, and that's what I love about the 4C model, because if you've seen it visually, it's, it's like a circle, right? And, right. and what it, it's supposed to convey like balance. It says over time, you have to do something in all four of these C areas. But yeah, we've seen some uh, e companies where they now have over index and the entire narrative and rhetoric is about the commerce part that, you know, you know, I just want to advise ERG leaders that they have to be able to address that some of their members may not celebrate the focus on, on the commerce, but I think it's absolutely necessary. No, I think, I think you're right, because oftentimes you go to work and mm -hmm. you are spending X amount of time doing your, whatever your official job is. Yep. And oftentimes you want to connect with folks that have similar cultural backgrounds yeah. to you yeah. or a uh, similar focus. And, you know, it's important if you're the one and only, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why these, you know, this 4C model, it's not a, you know, either or, right. You don't have to do career related stuff at the expense of commerce or you don't have to do, community stuff at the at the expense of culture initiatives. You know, it's, they're a, a both and, you know, right? at, at any given period of time, you may want to prioritize and emphasize one of the four C areas over the other. But those ERGs, that at least I have found, that tend to have sustainable long-term success over time do something in each C category. Mm -hmm. No, that makes, that makes total sense because mm -hmm. you want to be able to contribute, but you also want to be able to get something back, right? Absolutely. So it's mutually beneficial. And if you look at a partnership between the company and the individual, that's what it should be, mutually beneficial. Absolutely. And particularly for those folks who've raised their hand to be an ERG leader, um, you know, it's, it's something that it's hard to quantify the benefits to them if they leverage that, right? You know, because if, if, if you think about it, you know, and we know this, but if you're in a corporate environment, you move up within the company because you're smart and you work hard. Smart, work hard, smart, work hard. So, uh, you know, you, you, you get recognized, you, you advance, but sooner or later you get to a level where everybody else is smart and everybody else works hard, right? So you have to find a way to differentiate yourself from all the other smart, hardworking people in the room. And that's where an ERG leadership role can really help play dividends. Because if you're the chair, the president, the lead, whatever you want to call it, um, now you're developing a strategy, you're managing a team, you have a budget, you're running elbows, rubbing elbows with all these executives. So, you know, the ERG leadership roles are a great way to enhance your visibility, your capability, and your promotability. Right. Mm -hmm. um, no, but it's, sense. Yeah, but it surprises me still that at some companies, they have a tough time getting folks to volunteer for the leadership role that, you know, the leader is, is like the person who drew the shortest straw or, you know, didn't step back fast. I was like, I ain't doing it. Let's get married to do it. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and, and that's not always conducive to ERGs that well run. So I would definitely encourage those of you who are in employee resource groups, kudos for taking that first step. But 
I would say really consider taking on an ERG leadership role because of all the benefits it provides to you from a career and, and professional growth perspective. Uh, Robert, I want to switch gears a little yep. bit. I want to talk about how you got started with this particular focus, this particular space. Yeah, you know, it's and, and it's funny, and 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 not to make uh, go way into my history, but 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 you know, you know, I, I'm of Mexican descent, right? So soy Latino. Uh, my parents were born in Mexico, came to the U.S. Uh, I was born in the great state of Texas. But I grew up in Minnesota, right? And, and folks will say, Robert, how did that happen? Uh, you know, a, a long story short, my family and I, we were migrant workers, right? We used to go up to uh, Michigan to work the cherry fields, uh, North Dakota for sugar beets. Uh, yeah. And then un año, papi said, oye, mijo, there's a little Latino community here on the west side of St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. So that's where I moved when I was about six or seven. Uh, and that's where I grew up. Uh, but that's what led to this work because growing up in Minnesota, uh, great place to live, great place to raise a family, but not a lot of Hispanics in Minnesota yeah. when I was growing up. So uh, early on, I remember I struggled with my sense of identity, right? Because my parents, who were very well intentioned, the messages they gave me were, oh, mijo, no hablas español, just fit in, assimilate, you know, go play hockey with the Anglo kids. You know, we don't want you to be made fun of. We don't want you to have an accent. Uh, and, and I did, and I did that very well. Uh, but, you know, during high school, college, and definitely when I joined corporate America, you know, this, it's, it's kind of cliche now, but this concept of, you know, bringing your whole self to work, I definitely wasn't doing that, right? So I struggled with my sense of identity. And that's, and for me, what helped me turn the corner was some of my earliest employers had these employee resource groups. Uh, so I joined and, and, and you know, they helped me find my voice. They gave me a community to be a part of. They helped develop my skill set. They raised my visibility. Uh, and and so, so I would say without any hesitation that some of the career success I've had has been because of the foundations those ERGs had on my uh, professional and personal life. So. That's, that's why I've dedicated my career to helping, you know, those individuals who, you know, are working 80 hours a week already, like the rest of us, but yet have raised their hand and say, hey, I want to be a member of an ERG. I want to lead an ERG. I want them to be as uh, successful as possible. So that's what kind of got me started into this work is I saw the value um, that an ERG can have. I'm sorry, unfortunately, I can't hear you, Josephine. I lost, uh, I can see you, but I lost uh, your audio. There you go. There we go. I, um, I remember when I worked at Cargill and yeah. they're based in uh, Minneapolis. Yeah. Yeah. And every time I went there, I felt, I still, and this was a few years ago, I felt like I was the one and only. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's where, you know, for a lot of us who are part of uh, underrepresented groups, uh, you know, we, we, that sense of identity issue is very strong because we don't know if we should shout it from the rooftops and, and really, mm, yo soy Latino or whatever, uh, or if it's something we should downplay, right? Because you know, I don't know about you, but other than my parents, some of my early mentors were telling me, Robert, don't do that Latino thing, right? So, yes. so yes. the sense of identity, the, the pressure to assimilate uh, is very high uh, and stuff. So I, I love how ERGs, you know, that's probably falls more under the cultural piece where they're helping folks is, hey, whatever your sense of identity is, you should own it. Whether you're an unapologetically, you know, proud of your heritage, your ethnicity, uh, or if it's something you don't want to bring a lot of attention to, as long as you own that, you know, that's, that's all we can ask for you to do. What, what, I'm, what makes me sad is when sometimes you, you hear folks who say, well, I can't leverage that part of my identity because my employer doesn't support it or I don't have a lot of allies. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Not only that are you not bringing your whole self to work, but also your company is missing that part of the value that you bring to their organization. So I think you're, you're absolutely right, Robert. I think... Um you know, when, when you're able to come to terms with that, and like you, um, me has been more because of my name, Josefina Bonilla. Yeah. 
um, instead of saying Josefina, the recommendation was to say Josephine, yeah. Josefina. That way it didn't seem like I was so yeah. different than they were. So I, I get it. I totally yeah. get what you're talking about. Yeah. Talk to me about um, you as a leader. I mean, you have done so much work in this particular space. There is no doubt when people are talking about employee resource groups, you are the guru in that space. But it takes a lot of persistence, yeah. perseverance. Talk to me about some of your leadership styles. Yeah. Um, well, you know, one is based very much on what I shared with you earlier, right? This the sense that early in, on in my career, you know, I struggled with not just my sense of identity, but did I come across as being authentic, right? And, and again, this is something that a lot more popular as of late is this idea of being an authentic leader, right? So, you know, knowing that some of the work that I do, you know, is helping people feel much more comfortable in their own skin, you know, much more, you know, uh, confident in whatever their sense of identity is, uh, you know, that keeps me going because I know that that has a ripple effect, right? Because you know, the impact that ERGs had on me isn't just on me, it's on my, my family, my children, you know, it has this ripple effect, right? And, and the, the reason that kind of motivates me is because, you know, another part, at least within our community, right, the, the Latino community and many others, there's more of a focus on we versus the focus on I, right? So I often will say, hey, I'm going to you know, sacrifice some of my personal needs for the greater good of my community, right? So uh, whenever I've struggled, I've paused, I maybe didn't have a lot of confidence, you know, I always said, hey, you know, the, the needs uh, of our community are much too great and this work is too important for me not to do all that I can. So that has really helped me a lot. You know, as, as you recall, before we started the, you know, the, the webinar, we were talking about all the travel you know, that, that right. uh, we have done. And, you know, before this, I travel every week, right? Um, that takes a toll on my health, on my family, on my relationships. Uh, but again, there's part of me that says, hey, you know, I owe this, I, this knowledge that I have, this experience, these insights to, to, to the greater good, right? Even though that may, you know, not be easy for me. So that's what kind of drives me. That's what motivates me is, you know, whenever I, I pause and like I said, I, I lack that fortitude, I always say, hey, you know, I need to do this for my community more so than for myself. No, yeah, I think that's uh, definitely warranted. And how has, how have things changed for you with uh, the yeah, pandemic? Yeah, um, so not a whole lot of change with regards to my clients, right? You know, they, they, you know, I'm still doing the work that they, need me to do, of course, doing it virtually, right? Uh, definitely helping to, you know, retool, recollaborate. Uh, definitely, I'm not traveling, right, as none of us really are, which has been good for me. I, I think I've lost almost 15 pounds in the last, you know, 10 weeks. Uh, definitely spending more time with, I have two sons who are teenagers, uh, you know, spending more time with, with my family, so that's helped. Uh, but it's given me more time to kind of think and reflect. You know, I'm working on my, my third book now, uh, you know, doing some more kind of research, you know, reemphasizing some of the relationships that I have with professional contacts and partners. You know, when we get so busy with work, a lot of times you, you, you don't always have the bandwidth to reach out to those folks that you consider friends or you know, collaborators. So this has given me the time to reach out to them and say, hey, how you doing? How you been? How's your family? How can I help? Uh, because we need those networks. You know, we can't do this work alone. And, and it's good to every now and then invest in the equity of those relationships. And this has given me a chance to do that. Uh, Robert, uh, this is your third book. Yes, I'll be work, I'm working on my third book right now. Okay. And the first and second book, tell me about the second one. Yeah, uh, so again, uh, for those who know, don't know, the, the first book was Latino Talent, right? Japan came back and back, came out back in 2008. And that was more a book for, about the Latino community, but it really was for non-Latinos, right? Hey, help you understand more about us. If you want to recruit us, retain us, develop us. Uh, the, the most recent book that I co-authored with my good friend on the desk, Tapia, who's a 
senior partner at Corn Ferry. Uh, it's called Authentico, all right? The Definitive Guide to Latino Career Success. So that book is much more focused for uh, individuals in the Latino community. What can they do to uh, more effectively, let, not just advance their careers, but how do they leverage their Hispanic heritage as an asset, as a source of strength, as a superpower, if you will? So we studied, you know, 20 high powered, you know, extremely successful Hispanic executives, you know, CEOs, corporate board directors, political appointees, you know, graduates from the top schools. And we got some of their success stories. And that's what, uh, you know, we put into Authentical. It's been very well received. Uh, immediately, we had a Spanish language version of the book. Uh, now we have a, a, a workbook that accompanies it. We're about to go into the second edition uh, of the book that's been picked up by a, a traditional publisher, Bear uh, Kohler. Uh, so yeah, so that it, it continues to go well. And, and this message of, uh, again, authenticity, you know, if folks don't think you're the real deal, uh, it's gonna be difficult for you to advance. So yeah, I'm very proud of, of both books. And then the third book that I'm working on is gonna be specifically for employee resource groups. Wonderful. What's the name of the third one? Uh, right now, the correct? working title, it, it may change, but it's going to be called Next Generation ERGs, so Next Gen ERGs. Super. Yeah. And that should be out when? Uh, probably next year. You know, hopefully I'll finish it. Uh, uh, and, and I still have this idea if I'm going to have a co-author or not, uh, but definitely working on it now. Hopefully it'll be done this year out by 2021. Oh, super. I'm looking forward to uh, reading that. Um, I think that, you know, I'm a huge fan of employee resource groups. Yeah. I can see, I've seen the value of them. As you know, uh, we have a, a mutual client um, that we yeah. worked on for an employee resource group summit um, that you're very heavily involved in. So I can see the value and I see the numbers. Um, and they make sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, right now, you know, if, 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 I know we're starting to run out of time, but, you know, for those of you who are ERG leaders or, or members, what companies are really looking for you to, to do with this whole COVID-19 is, you know, you have to decide, are you a, a leader? Are you the type of ERG leader that is going to do or you type the ERG leader that's going to lead, right? And right now, companies need both. You know, there's some ERG leaders who are kind of a bit uh, paralyzed. They're kind of navel-gazing. They're kind of waiting. Well, let's just wait and see. Uh, but they're not doing a whole lot, right? You know, part of it is because they can't get together. But, you know, in this time, you know, just kind of sitting back and waiting, we're finding isn't a winning strategy. So we need ERG leaders are willing to roll up our sleeves. Okay, okay, there's a new normal. We're going to do this, this, and this. And we're just you know, taking the bull by the horns and just kind of making some new actions happen. Uh, and there's also another type where, they, hey, right now they're really focused on leading. So they're establishing a vision. They're saying, hey, this is what we can become. Hey, this new, you know, this new working environment gives us the opportunity to do this, that, and something else. So uh, they're really trying to lead and kind of create that inspiring vision of the future. So, you know, whether you're more of a doer or more of a kind of a leader, uh, we definitely need that type of mindset more so than one that's just kind of sitting back and waiting and see. Right. I think also, um, Robert, it's a case of defining what that next step is, right? What that new normal is. Yeah. And you can only do that if you're front and center and you're doing the work. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're not telling you to have to, you know, have the answers of what that new normal can be, right? We, we don't really know. But, you know, it's, it's kind of what I call scenario planning is just kind of say, kind of give yourself a range of what that new normal may be, and have a plan that kind of can fall any, you know, as long as the new normal is anywhere within this range, you'll be okay. You know, it's, you know, we're, we're not predictors, you know, we don't always know what the future is going to be, but if we have a general sense of what we think it's going to be, we should strive for that. And, and that should allow you to at least try to move forward. Super. Well, Robert, thank you so much for joining oh. us. I'm sorry that we had some technical difficulty today uh, with the webinar, but uh, you're spot on. You continued great information. Uh, the best way to contact you is through? Uh, well, my website is uh, www.drradvisors.com. So just, yeah, an email at robert at 
drradvisorsjust.com. Um, just do a search on me. I'm on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'd uh, be more than glad to answer any questions you may have, be a resource. And uh, of course, thanks to you uh, for doing all you can to kind of bring, a, bring our community together, uh, share some thought leadership, and just for being a true uh, champion for diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Robert, and we will talk soon. Thank All you right. for joining Take care, us. everybody. Thanks for listening.